four major numbers dealing with a client, husband and wife, $11,540 per month net is what we're bringing in. And that number can be as high as 12,590. Starting in the new year, their income is gonna be more around this number because their income is increasing. They're gonna get a, a, a raise. So when I map out the strategy, I'm actually going to show income at this 11,540 throughout the whole year of 2023. And then I'm gonna do the same thing with income around 12,590. And it's gonna give us a nice little range, okay? Total expenses, okay? Total everything that leaves their checking account, whether it's on a monthly, semi-annual, annual, quarterly, debt payments, toilet paper, right? Toothpaste, bathroom products, birthdays, holidays, vacations, taxes, giving, tithing, saving, and everything, 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 right? $8,390. Why do I stress that? Because when I'm getting numbers from you guys that are not clients and you're reaching out or you're brand new and you're watching the videos and you're trying to run your own numbers by comparing the, the case studies that you see, be aware that if you're gonna properly run a velocity banking strategy, you need to account for all of the numbers, everything. You can't say that you make 11,540 and you spend 8,390 where you cash flow $3,150, but from that $3,150, you give a thousand to the church each and every month. So you can't say that you have $3,150. Why? Because 1,000 of that is going to the church, not you. So you need to put $9,390 in your expenses, cash flowing $2,150, because if you make the, the mistake of determining your chunk amount based off of 3150 instead of 2150 you're going to find yourself in potentially a over leveraged position because you didn't account for your tithes and offerings that is an expense to the kingdom right if you tithe or you give that is an expense coming out of what you're bringing in so don't trick yourself don't put yourself under an illusion right of oh i have this much cash flow and you really don't because it will hurt you when you're leveraging debt right we are trying to offset our borrowing costs as much as humanly possible so don't finagle fi finesse right the numbers right or else it's a fake it's a fugazi right don't do that so with that being said total expenses everything coming out 8390 total debt 205 570 that consists of two mortgages one is a rental one is a primary interest rates are pretty low because these were acquired back in like 2019 2020 when interest rates were around three and four percent so they have very very low rates very competitive they have cash flow between as low as 3150 or as high as 4200 if we bring in that amount of money okay We've got a second position home equity line of credit 150,000 is the credit limit back in 2019 okay this is a client i've been working with for many years four four years right 4.5% was their original starting interest rate on their debt tool. Over the years, it's gone up, especially in the last year, 2022. So now they're sitting at a 7.75% interest rate. This is a really good case study for those of you who have been doing velocity banking for quite some time, right? Two years, three years, four years plus, and you may not even maybe you're not even paying attention okay maybe you didn't notice but the bank is not telling you right i have my phone on the table the whole time so you're watching double me sorry about that so you've got the the banks is not telling you when your line of credit rate goes up so this is a refresher right this is a hey pay attention to this if you're someone that's been doing velocity banking for a while and you had a p lock or heloc first lien second lien any type of variable rate line of credit do me a favor check your rate because you think you might be at a 4.5 or 5.5 and really you're at an eight or seven and a half percent it's not the end of the world it's just we need to pay attention to what is our cost right so this is going to be a really really good case study for those that have been doing velocity banking for a while you have a policy in place that you've been funding and all we're doing here is simply tweaking 
the strategy, we're making a few improvements and just looking at what are some opportunities on the table. One of the things that is great about velocity banking and infinite banking is very fluid. Okay. So it's not something you just stay in one position and you just keep doing this one thing and right. It's very fluid, very, very loose. Okay. Very flexible. There's some pros and cons to that. The con is you have to be on top of your game. You have to consistently look at your numbers. But when it becomes a habit, when it becomes culture that you look at your numbers weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, you're constantly reviewing your numbers. You create a P&L statement every single month for the amount of money you bring in and what's coming out. Once it becomes culture, it's no longer a hassle. It's just one of those things. It natural. Okay, let's review. What are our rates? What's going on? Where can I save more money? Where can I continue to offset more money? And that's what we're doing here. We're identifying where they're currently at, what the current strategy is, and what it can be and what the potential result of that would be, right? So we've got that debt to 150K. As of right now, the balance is at zero. So we owe nothing on the HELOC, which is great. They just have the two mortgage debts. They're at a 7.75% interest rate. They hit me up, so Denzel, I'm at a 7.75 interest rate, right? I'm wondering if it still makes sense to use this debt tool or can we do something else, right? Can we do something else? The answer is yes, and we're gonna identify what that is. So in addition to their debt tool from the bank, they've established their own line of credit, their own debt tool, which is the high cash value life insurance policy whole life policy with Guardian started it in 2019 they backdated it right so the anniversary dates in December when they established it in 2019 they backdated the the policy so that they could max fund it for 2019 twice so that that can happen sometimes that makes sense sometimes people like to do that where it's like for example if you have a birthday in January right between January and less than six months out, right? Less than, do I go like that, I think? So less than six months out, I think something like that. Under six months, so that would be what, June? So between January and June or sooner, based on your birth date, right? So I would say my birthday's on the 4th, right? January 4th, six months later, June 4th. So anytime before June 4th, I'm still my current age and a half. All right, so I'll give you an example. When 2023 hits, January 4th, I'm turning 27, right? My girlfriend just like blew her eyes open. She's like, dang, boy, you old. So 27, boom, right? Then past June 4th, I'll be 27 and a half. According, you know, life insurance, this is how they look at it. So in that little window, if I was to establish a policy, I can set my anniversary date to January 4th even though we're in maybe May. Let's say I started the policy in May. I funded it, say 30K. Well, traditionally, you would have to go one year later, May 2024 is when I would be able to put in another 30K. In this case, if we're in May of 2023, backdate it, anniversary date is set to my birthday, then by January 4th, 2024, boom you're funding another 30k so it's it's almost like you're funding or it is 30k and 30k in less than a year so you get two in and that obviously increases your cash flow position this could make sense certain situations not always right some people that want to retain their age right could make sense so that's what happened here so when i say that they started the policy in 2019 technically by now we're approaching year five i think i think five and then 2023 will be in year six right on their part so it's 2019 2020 2021 2022 but they had an extra you know 30k that they're able to fund because they backdated it so really in a four-year time frame they funded it five times at thirty thousand dollars a year so that's what they're funding that's the max amount that they're funding into the policy 30k a year base premium three thousand bucks right cash value is somewhere around 152k by 2023 anniversary date will be around 187,000 and some change now they have 90,000 
in loans. So they have been doing velocity banking to max fund the policy, velocity banking to pay off debt. They've already paid off all the debt that they've wanted to pay off. All they have left is the mortgages, which are at really low rates compared to where their HELOC is, right? The HELOC's now at 7.75. I think they have one mortgage at like 3% and the other one's at like 4.2 or 4.5 or something like that. And they've already um, made quite a few payments, chunk payments to the mortgage. So there's not a whole lot of interest savings left. And they're more focused on these, these areas right here, okay? Where they're building a business in IT, information tax so that's their industry they're building a business there they want to create content they want to become a consultant speaker right they're also looking at real estate so the strategy has shifted over the years first it was pay off debt right recover cash flow build credit all this good stuff then it became max fund a policy with their line of credit because they didn't have 30k just sitting but they did have it in the heloc and so they borrowed here Right. And to make sense, if you're like, does it make sense, Denzel, to be paying interest to max fund the policy? Or should I just take my free cash flow each and every month and fund the policy up until I hit 30K in a year? OK, you can absolutely do that. But there is a cost. Right. So when you're funding a policy, you can fund it annually, semi quarterly or monthly or whenever like at any time certain companies allow you to just dump money in whenever you want guardian is one of those companies where you can just dump money in whenever you want now the most inexpensive way to fund a life insurance policy for the infinite banking concept is going to be annual because when you do monthly quarterly semi-annual they tack on some additional fees and these fees depending on how much we're putting in can somewhere sometimes be around 500 or more dollars so the way i look at it is i'm like oh if i borrow 30 at 4.5 and then do velocity banking and reduce 4.5 to less than two percent in net costs for the whole year let's say let's do the math 30k times 2% is $600, meaning that I would owe 30k for 12 whole months. And we know that's not the case when we're doing velocity banking, right? It's more like we're paying dollars and cents for the first four to six, six to nine months gets to a point where you completely offset your costs. And that 600 bucks, in some cases over a period of 12 months, can become half that number. So maybe they only pay 3% in cost. So at, throughout the whole year, right? Maybe they reduce their costs to less than 1%, 2%. Now let's say it was 2%, 600 bucks for the whole year. Let's just say that was the case. Then you factor in the cashback rewards that the client would get and that would decrease the number. But let's say that was included and it's still 600 bucks. Does that make sense? 500 was my cost in the policy, 600 cost in the HELOC. And here's the other factor is the cash value day one begins to grow as opposed to paying in 3000 month one, 3000 month two, 3000 month three, 3000, right? All the way up until I get to 30 K. You kept doing that. Understand that the cash value is growing by that dollar amount. So it's like dollar cost averaging, right? So it's only growing by the amount of money that's in there, obviously. So if I have 30 K growing day one, throughout the whole year, my cash value is going to perform better than the person that pays 3000 a month. Because remember, you've got some of that 3k is going to cost that my 30k did not pay for, right? I paid some of it over here, but then can completely offset it. So in certain cases, again, it, it makes sense, borrow from here, bring your borrowing costs to basically nothing. That's usually what we're always shooting for. Whatever I pay, I completely offset it through cashback rewards and velocity banking. And then when I look at those two other things, the cost, it's its like you were going to pay it no matter what, right? That cost is there, whether you do it monthly or annually. It's just who pays less. That's what we're solving for. And so more, more often than not, we're paying less in total net costs when we fund it annually. So I just wanted to illustrate that. That's very important for you to know. That was the strategy. There you go. Velocity banking, infinite banking coming together, improving it a little bit, right? Little tweaks, nothing crazy, but it has a nice compounded effect over the years. So coming back, 
policy, Guardian, started 2019, we're in year five, funding 30K a year is the max, base premium is 3,000, cash value is a little over 150K. Loans, 90,000, the interest rate on that 90K is 5.65%. So 90,000 times 5.65%, that's what we're paying per year on 90K, paying 5,085 bucks. Obviously, some of that 5K is getting offset by the total cash value growth in the policy from the dividends and the guarantees, right? So the, this 5,000 goes to the insurance company. The insurance company pays a dividend to my cash value as if I didn't have the 90K borrowed out, right? That 90K went and did things already and it got returns. They saved thousands of dollars. They recovered cash flow. They increased income. So that 90K has been solved for all they're doing. We're in a point now where they're like, okay, what's the next step? Line of credit's at zero. Should I borrow from the HELOC and then pay off the loan on my policy? Well, that wouldn't make sense, right? Because now you're pushing 7.75, right? You're moving 5.65 simple interest to 7.75 simple interest. So whenever you're looking at two different lines of credit where the interest is calculated the same you typically will go with the lower rate in terms of where you position your money you will also not borrow from the higher rate to pay off the lower rate that wouldn't make sense and then what if you're like well denzel what if i borrow from here paid off my loan and then took a, a loan out of here and pay back the heloc and i'm like well what did you do you didn't do anything all you did was increase your cost. So I don't want to do that. That would not be wise, but maybe there's another option on the table here that we can look at, right? So those are all the important numbers that gives you the full context, right? From there, now what we do, here's what the here's what their current strategy has been looking like. Current, current position. Income goes into their checking account, right? All money goes into their checking account. They then move that into their HELOC. They're doing velocity banking. So all money goes into their debt tool. Expenses were coming out to pay bills. Cash flow stays. They then would borrow out 30K out of their HELOC to checking account. Checking account max funds their IBC policy, right? Their high cash value, whole life insurance policy. Cool. From there, they took out a loan with a certain amount to invest. They're max funding their HSA. I believe at the time they're max funding Roth and they're also sending money to their business, right? Okay, cool. Here's the potential strategy. We get rid of the HELOC temporarily. What I mean by that, we're not closing it. We're just leaving it dormant. We're not gonna mess with it. The rate has increased our borrowing cost. Went from 4.5 to 7.75, right? So that's a 3.25% increase. So it's making less and less sense to even use the tool. We can now get more by either Snowball or I can go to a bank, I can approach a certain bank and get what's called a cash value collateral line of credit or cash value collateral loan, CVCL for short, cash value collateral loan. Another word for it is an insurance backed line of credit. We can now establish our own debt tool at potentially a lesser rate than both of the rates, right? Potentially. It's not always the case, but sometimes it is. In this situation, that's what we're looking at. So the potential strategy is we can position ourselves. Income goes into our checking account. The HELOC's at zero. So instead of borrowing it, we're no longer gonna borrow from that. We go to a bank, get a cash value collateral line of credit, which means that this whole 90,000 will get paid off in one shot. So the bank will pay off the $90,000 loan with the insurance company at that 5.65% rate. And that 5,085 interest gets wiped out from the insurance company. But now I owe 90,000 in a personal line of credit, right? With that new bank. The credit limit that we can get is up to 95% of whatever is available in cash value, not what's available, the total, despite whatever there is in loans, the total amount of cash value in the policy, let's say is 152 times that by 95%, you're going to get 144,000 and some change. So I just rounded it down and said, okay, they go to the bank and get 144K, right? They'll day one, they'll owe 90 grand, right? In the line from there they can go to a 5.5% interest rate. 
So we go from 7.75 and 5.65 to 5.5, right? And now I can do what? Velocity banking. The alternative, if they were not to get a cash value collateral line of credit, they can do velocity banking on the policy itself. It's just going to be a little bit slower and not as efficient. What do I mean by that? Well, they owe 90 here, right? and they have this much in cash value, that's about the same in credit limit, yes? Okay, but it's a lesser rate, 5.65 as opposed to 7.75. HELOC's at zero. What they can literally do is when they get a paycheck, right? They can literally dump their whole paycheck and make a payment to the policy. It's already max funded for the year, so they can make a payment to the policy, right? Each and every time they get a paycheck, and then they borrow out, say, one time a month or maybe twice a month, they have to time it correctly, and that's the only issue that someone would have. So the safest thing to do would be you just take out a loan for $8,390 from the cash value, right? And now that's back in their checking account, and their $11,540 sat inside of the policy brings down the borrowing costs. So they're doing velocity banking. The only issue with that is it's not as efficient, right? Because when you're doing velocity banking on the line of credit, we can instantly move money in and out of the line of, of the HELOC to the checking and then checking to the HELOC. That's instant. You cannot do that with a policy. Whenever you make a payment to your policy, it takes a couple of days for it to register and clear and for it to show up. And then when you take out a policy loan, it takes what three to five business days right if you do direct deposit that's the quickest maybe two to three four business days that's those are all days that i'm losing on interest right so it's not impossible you can do that but i think with a cash value collateral line of credit we can go a little faster despite whatever the rate is right let's say the rate was higher than 5.65 it would still make sense in some cases it would still make sense because you can bring that 5.5 cost down to less than two which is increasing the efficiency right so income checking account checking account all income boom goes into cash value collateral line of credit from there you would make a chunk from their line because now they have a whole line of 144 two thirds of that is 95k so what do we do first velocity banking on what's owed and then when an opportunity presents itself i've got all this credit that i can use to invest and max fund the policy here's where it gets very interesting guys check this out the cash value collateral line of credit is money that is secured by the cash value in my life insurance policy the 152k right same money in two locations i have 152 this is growing at a guaranteed rate of return guaranteed every single year nowhere but up it's growing compounded tax-free right let's not forget about that that money's growing meanwhile the bank gave me access to the same dollars 144k i owe 90 on it we're in december of 2022 the next anniversary date is december 2023 right anniversary date december 2023 so 12 months from now i do velocity banking the same money this is what's really cool the same money right 152 here 144 here credit line same dollar can be used again to max fund the policy of 30k before i go any like i don't want to lose anybody here look what's happening my income boom all my income goes into the credit line that's one one use right the same money in that credit line gets pulled out to pay bills second use i have a credit card or credit cards cashback rewards same expense number before it gets spent it gets spent on the credit card third use right cashback rewards also manipulating and lowering my borrowing costs in the credit line so we got money going in one use money coming out two uses money getting spent on the credit card for cashback rewards to offset your expenses your expense cost of borrowing three use third use the fourth use the same money that i'm borrowing from is growing over here at a tax-free compounded rate of return four use four use okay four uses same dollar fifth use I chunk the same money to invest and then max fund the policy that originally the bank gave me a credit line for that's growing at a tax-free compounded rate of return. So we're at what? Five, six uses, right? Five, six uses, same dollars. Watch this, okay? Let's go through the numbers here. 
let's say we owe 90 grand day one, 5.5%. Okay, let's do some math. 90K times 5.5%. $4,950. So max amount of interest I can pay in a year now, it was at 5,085. It now went down to 4,950. Okay. Divide by 365. That's $13.05 a day. I'm gonna write that over here. So 13.5 on 90K. How long will I owe 90K? Never, never. Why? Income is going to go directly into that line as soon as it's established. So here's how it looks. Let's say we're in the month of January is when we start this. We're in December 2022 now as I record this, working with the client. Come January, let's say they get this fully in place. We owe 90, income goes in, right? And again, they're making more money by then, but I'm using a lower, a lower amount to be conservative. 11,540 goes in, right? 90K minus 11,540. Balance, the lowest balance would be 78,460 times 5.5% divided by 365. Now I'm at 11.8. So I never owe that 13.5. I don't even have to look at that, right? So 90K minus 11.540. Then what? Expenses come out, 8,390. Balance ends 86,850 at the end of January. Times that by 5.5% divided by 365. So we're at 11 and $13.08. Add those two numbers up, 13.08 plus 11 and 80 cents divide by two average daily borrowing costs the first month is your most expensive month twelve dollars and 44 cents a day is what they would be paying times 30 days so we're at 373 in the first month 373.30 right over here that number would have been higher right on the heloc 90,000 owed 7.75 that number is going to be higher over here it's higher right 5.65 numbers higher right 373.30 times 12 months Look where the number went. It went from what? 4950 Now we're at $4,479.65. But wait, are we going to owe 86850 for the next 11 months? No. So what's going to end up happening is that 4950 went down to 4479.65 Over a 12-month period, we could probably get that number less than 2K somewhere around 2000 or less, especially if they bring in more money, that number is probably going to be around 1500 or less in cost. What is that? Less than 2.5%? What are we at? Like 1.9? And then you factor in cashback rewards. This person spending 8,390 of that amount, they're running like three plus thousand dollars through credit cards each and every month. 2%, 1%, 3%, 4, 5% cashback rewards plus the statement credit. Guys, we're looking at wiping out the whole borrowing costs to nothing just through the cashback rewards and the velocity banking itself, not even including what got earned in the policy when they go to borrow and max fund it, right? So here's what would happen, right? Now that you know how to run the cost, I'm just going to go real quick and show you the timeline. So we're in January, 86,850. We're going off income at 11,540 and cash flow at 3,150 throughout the whole year. So February, boom, goes down. Income goes in, expenses out. March, April, May, June, July, all the way to December. We're at as high as 52,200. If they actually brought in 12,590 each and every month for 2023, the balance will be somewhere around 39,600 owed. So anywhere between 39,6 and 52,2, 52,200 is what we'll owe 2023 on the cash value collateral line of credit. Then they make the chunk because it's their anniversary date for 30 grand. So they're borrowing at nothing to now max fund a policy that they're getting a guaranteed 4% return on. The internal rate of return at this point in year six their internal rate of return is probably between two and 3%, but I'll be conservative and say two. So let's say their, their IRR internal rate of return is at a positive 2%, right? So on 152,000 plus 30, is that 182, that's what it would go up to when they first fund it in, right? And then minus the base premium and cost, maybe it's a little bit less, say it's 179 times 2%, 3,580. Because you, whenever you get to a, uh, there's a point in the policy where you get, where you hit break even, where you literally you put 30K in and that's how much shows up in cash value. That may be the case 
in policy year six for this account, if that was the case, then they are at 182 and let's times a 2% internal rate of return. So that's 3,640. So 3,640, if it's a 3% IRR, they're at 5,460, 5,460. Okay. Okay. Pretty cool stuff. Now, this is what the illustration said that they'll be at year six, policy year six. So if I'm at, at the end of policy year five, I'm at 152 at the end and I add 30K in principal. So I'm at 182, but then it went up to 187, right? So what does that mean? It grew by five grand. So it's it's between two and 3% because 3% is 5,460. 2% is 3,640. So if it grows to 187, they got somewhere in between a two and 3% internal rate of return. Yes, did I do the math right on that? Maybe I'm wrong. If I'm not wrong, regardless, if I'm off a little bit, there's an increase from borrowing at nothing, nothing. I borrow at nothing and I'm borrowing the same money that the bank gave me collateral on that I've already been dumping money into. That's this is where my mind kind of like explodes a little bit. I don't know if it explodes for you a little. You're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You're saying the same money from the cash value is now my line of credit and I'm doing velocity banking on that. And over a 12 month period, I brought the amount owed from 90 all the way down to somewhere around 39 and 52. And then I borrow those same dollars, 30K to max fund the policy to bring it all the way up to 187,000 in cash value. And here's what gets cooler. Once a year, every year, I call the bank and I can get a credit line increase, right? So we increased the credit line to 177,000. So how much capital did I give myself? How much new capital? 177 minus 144. So I gave myself a $33,000 credit line increase without credit check, without them pulling my credit. Like it's just boom, instantaneous. Here you go. So the balance goes up to anywhere between 69,600 or 82,000 less than where we started, right? So every year they can keep doing that, right? And then the the credit line increase. So then what happens, guys? What happens when our credit line increases? Our leverage capability goes up. 177 times two thirds, if we stick to the rules, is now 116,000. It was 95K. It was at 95K. If I owe as high as 82, minus 82, we've got 34K of leverage. We can go do something with it. Yeah, here's where it gets interesting. That they may not, in this situation, they may not even have to really borrow to do anything because part of their expenses, their 8,390, is already accounting for money that they invest outside of the policy, right? This is just the cushion money that sits. And then when it's ready to be deployed, then we deploy it. But their main focus is the startup funding for their business, which is already included in the 8,390. Their max funding in HSA already included in the 8,390. So my credit line won't increase when I fund the business and fund the HSA. If they come across a real estate opportunity where the down payment is 30K or 50K, well then boom, then the credit line would increase. And then I would just tell them to be mindful of their leverage capacity according to their numbers. So if they're at 69,600, well, obviously that gives them way more space. You go from 69, from 90 to 69, 12 months, including that 30K chunk that comes right back to you. So it's like, look, you pull 30, goes into policy, then you call the bank and say, give me a credit line increase and you get the 30 back at your disposal and you keep it going, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going every single year. That is a wrap for this. That's velocity banking, infinite banking coming together, small tweak. All we did here, guys, was solve for paying less interest in our borrowing costs and just being a little bit more fluid with the velocity banking, infinite banking put together. They were doing velocity banking and infinite banking with a home equity line of credit in the second position. And then if they move along, then it's just going to be velocity banking with a cash value collateral line of credit to max fund their policy and invest. That's it. They're not paying off debt because the debt's low. They're making way higher returns by investing, building their business, increasing the top line, their income, which is going to decrease their borrowing costs even further, right? 